welcome to Sheboygan County Government, working for you. My name is Adam Payne, Sheboygan County Administrator and co-host of this program with Chairman Mike Vandersteen. And today we have a couple of special guests with us, one from the Health and Human Services Department, actually two from the department, but one leading the pack, our director, Ann Wonderjim. Welcome, Ann. Thank you. And also from the department today, we have Mr. Bruce Kress, who is the Environmental Program Health Inspector. <laughs> Let's get this right. Environmental Health Program Supervisor. Correct. Good to have you with us, Bruce. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. And we're going to start with you. Please share with our viewers some of the core program areas in your department. Uh, of our 22, as you know, it's one of the largest with a $31 million budget, so you're going to have to give a brief overview. And you know I like to be short, Adam, so I will do that this time. Instead of talking about our structure, I'd like to talk about the types of services we provide to keep sure. it short. So we have overall responsibility for individuals, what I always say, birth through death. So we do prenatal care through our Division of Public Health. We do child and family services. We do uh, behavioral health services, so we work with both children and adults with mental health issues or substance abuse issues. And then we do the financial assistance programs through our economic support area, so we determine eligibility for food share, which used to be food stamps. Uh, the Medicaid program, also known as medical assistance. So basically what we do is we provide services throughout the lifespan of individuals when there are pressing needs that they are eligible for. And then as you know, most recently we started our Aging and Disability Resource Center. So that incorporated some of the former um, Office on Aging services into a one-stop shop for people. So we also do the services for uh, people who are elderly or people um, who have um, disabilities. So that's kind of a short summary of what we do. That's about as concise as I've heard a summary for a department of your size. How long have you been the director now of the department? You know, I knew you were going to ask me that, and I honestly don't remember. I've been with the county in one capacity or another for about 25 years. I want to say it's probably right around eight years that I've been the director. So you've been having such a good time, you don't even know when you started anymore. You're Absolutely. Just flying along. <laughs> Sometime in uh, June of some year in around 2000. <laughs> well, if you asked me, I wouldn't remember the specific <laughs> date either. A uh, number of employees that work for your department, about a $31 million budget. How many employees mm -hmm. do you have? And, and brag about them a little bit. I know you've got some good yes, ones. Yes, we do. I'd like to bring them all along, but they wouldn't fit in this room, unfortunately. We have about 198 staff um, at any point in time. I think you know our table of organization is a little bit larger, but given some vacancies that we have with budget concerns, it's about 198. Um, I really can't say enough about the staff. Uh, they are the individuals who are out there working directly with the people that we provide services to. Um, we have nurses, and the nurses right now are very, very busy. We have our immunization clinics, our women, infant, and children program where we provide the vouchers for formula and juices and, and allowable foods. We have social workers, and we have social workers both working with our adults and our elderly, and social workers that actually go out and conduct our child abuse and neglect investigations. We have social workers who work with children who are in trouble with the law, our juvenile justice system. We have psychiatrists on staff, we have psychologists, so we do uh, counseling for individuals who have behavioral health needs. And then we have this classification that we call case managers, and there's no way to adequately describe what they do, but they will be out with individuals in the community. Um, so if you might be an individual who is an adult and has a severe and persistent mental health issue, they will work with you on your socialization skills, help you with employment. Um, so there's just any number of staff that are out there helping people on a day-to-day -day basis in their homes, in the community, and in office. So um, that's kind of what we do in terms of internal. But then, as you know, we purchase services out of that $31 million budget. So there are individuals in the community who live with people in group homes and adult family homes, um, physicians and doctors that we purchase services from. So. Um, in addition to our 198 employees, there are hundreds of individuals throughout Sheboygan County that have employment due to our purchasing services on behalf of the people we serve. And it, you have such a good command over the department. Uh, it always amazes me out of our 22 departments, the complexity of programs and services, but none more than the Health and Human Services Department. You have such a broad range of important services that are provided. And I think what our viewers are going to be particularly interested in hearing next is this, is this st statistic, 198 employees. <coughs> mm -hmm. And as you said, also 
help from a lot of very important contract providers. Right. But how many folks are they serving throughout Sheboygan County? And you know, for the first time, I can give you an answer that is more accurate than I ever could before because we're um, migrating to a new information system. And as we took information out of all our state systems, we came up with 68,000 individuals that are individuals within that new computer system. But I have to do the caveat that some of those um, individuals may have received services and their cases are now closed because we need to maintain their record for anywhere from three to seven years. So by next year, when I do this program, I'll actually know how many are open or closed. So our best guess yet in terms of actual individual people is probably right around 35 to 40,000 at any point in time. And that doesn't include what Bruce will talk about later in terms of the breadth of people that are impacted by what we do. Uh, which is 100% of Sheboygan County residents in one way or another. So we have about 115,000 people in the county, and at any given time, 30,000, give or take, mm -hmm. are being served by this department. And, right. and it's a beautiful transition to, to Bruce, because Bruce, of course, is out there making sure that those of us who, and those of the viewers who like to get out, and whether it's go out to dinner, or uh, swim. swim. Go to the beach. Make sure that they're safe. Right. Bruce, please share a little bit about, first, let's start with yourself. How long have you been with the county and touch on your role and responsibilities? Well, I worked in the city of Milwaukee for 31 years and retired from there. And I was retired for two weeks. And my wife said, about time to get a job. So I applied for this job in 2001, and it's been very successful since then. And we cover a lot of places, the facilities in Sheboygan County. And the reason why the county went into the state agent status is because we could give better service to the citizens and to the operators of the facilities. And in Sheboygan County we have 780 facilities we have to inspect at least once a year. There's several facilities we check twice or three times a year. Um, last year we inspected 1,238 different facilities throughout the county. 1,231 facilities in right. one year. One year. So you must have at least a dozen staff, right? No, Bruce? we only have one other inspector. So it's myself and Dave Rodiger who inspect all these facilities in the county. Outstanding. So um, it gives us a lot of time to do this facility. So what are you, we, what are you predominantly doing? We inspect the restaurants, mm -hmm. the taverns, the schools, the lodging facilities, hotels, motels, campgrounds recreational facilities, pools and rec camps, tattoo shops. We also provide services at all the temporary events that have food service. We also check the non-transient community wells. So if there's a private well at a tavern or a school, we check that. We take bacteria samples and nitrate samples. When we have those samples come back safe, we tell the operator. And last year we had two operators that had unsafe water and they had to sanitize those wells. And we took further samples and then we okayed the water once it came back safe. So if you're not protect out there us. doing that, people are going to that facility, that restaurant, that bar, wherever it is, right. and drinking that nice looking glass of ice water before their meal. And in fact, it's contaminated. Yeah. Well, if it is contaminated, then we close them down and they have to chlorinate the well. But one thing I know you've been very successful in is really developing good rapport with the people you're working with and, and training them to make sure that they're meeting certain standards. What generally do you see out there? What's not uncommon that you have to work with people with? Um, in general, the restaurants and some of the other places that serve food, we have the critical orders and the non-critical orders. The critical orders would be safe hand washing to make sure they're handling the food safely with clean hands or with gloves. They're not misusing the gloves. Last week we had a place that the lady had gloves on. She was mopping the floor and a customer came in and she decided to make a sandwich without changing the gloves. Well, you can't make a sandwich with contaminated gloves. So I had to educate her on you know, changing the gloves, washing the hands before she put on new gloves. So that's one of the critical items. Another critical item is the temperature. We make sure that cold food is kept at 41 degrees or less, and hot food, the minimum it should be kept at is 135. We generally like to see food hotter than that, but that's the minimum that the state requires. So we were like messengers. We make sure that they are following the food code that the state and federal government 
um, has us to enforce. Is that one of the more frequent violations? Yes. You'll see temperature, not where it needs to be. Temperature, right. Temperature and hand washing, hair nets. Um, they don't like to wear hair nets when they prepare the food. But it is very necessary because hair is very dirty. It could land into the food or onto the food contacts surfaces. And then some of the non-critical orders are the cleaning orders. You know, nobody's going to get sick off a dirty floor or a dirty restroom, but it just is not a healthy presentation to uh, the customer. So we go in and we get a lot of complaints. Last year we got 36 citizens' complaints, varied from the uh, restaurants that are dirty or you know, utensil was dirty, to garbage in the back room or a housing complaint that the house was dirty or there was garbage in the yard. So we took care of that for so, the citizen. So do you generally have a, a systematic approach where you're making sure you hit so many a month or throughout the year so you, you get through all of them, plus you have to respond to complaints or how do you normally approach it? Well, in the restaurants, we have the low complexity, medium complexity, and high complexity. The low complexity would be like a pizza in a tavern or a small uh, store. We go into that once a year because it's, it's already prepared. All I have to do is heat it up. And then we have the medium that might make sandwiches, cold sandwiches, so there's not that much going on in food preparation. Then you have the more complex menus like the American Club or some of the other restaurants, Stefano's, where they make food from scratch, whether it be soups or stews or pies. And there's more complex um, menu items and there's more possibility of a food contamination. So we usually check those two to three times a year. And if we do write orders, if critical orders we want them complied with immediately or th within three days. The non-critical orders, such as cleaning or painting something, we give them seven to 28 days to correct that. And if they're not corrected, we go back again and we try to insist and try to educate them and why it should be corrected. And if they still haven't been corrected, we call them in and they talk to the health officer. And so far in the past eight years I've been up here, we've taken away eight licenses. We have not renewed eight licenses. Places went out of business, then the new operator came in and that's when places were remodeled and brought up to the health codes. I know you put on real good training as well. You, you provide that. Can you touch on that very quickly? Um, Wisconsin law requires that there be a food certified food manager on duty anytime food is being prepared. We teach this National Sanitation Foundation course. It's called Surf Safe. And we've trained over 600 food handlers in the county, which is really great. That's why it's cut down our critical orders dramatically. And we have a lot of cleaning orders. So um, it really has helped. And this certification is good for five years. After five years, we teach them a recertification course that's a four-hour classroom. And we've trained over 300 people on that. So it's really been successful. I have such appreciation for the work you do from two angles. One, when I was in high school and college, I worked at a big boy in a country kitchen <laughs> and a couple of other restaurants to, to make money during the summer months. And, and uh, when you get a job in a facility like that, there isn't a tremendous amount of training, number right. one. And number two, it wasn't like you went through junior high and high school learning about food <coughs> serving and, and handling. And I think back to those days when I was a teenager and young person doing that. And then also now where occasionally you'll get out to dinner with your wife or over the lunch hour. And it's nice to know that someone is checking in and providing that training and just making those, making sure those improvements occur. Mm -hmm. We had the opportunity a number of years ago, Bruce, you know, to go out and I saw how you systematically looked at things and then worked with that owner to, in a very respectful, courteous manner, share with them some, some tips and it was well received. You know, it's to their benefit. I think our program is very well received. You know, we try to communicate with them and try to educate them. Because you know they can anybody can go into restaurant business without any experience, right. and I guess it's our responsibility to teach them. And we've developed the food safety information manual for them, so it talks on five critical items of foodborne illnesses. We talk about allergens. We talk about safe food facts, about proper food handling, proper glove use, how to calibrate a thermometer. So those are all things we go through with the operator, so that they are educated, and. We also have signs that are posted 
in the kitchen or throughout the premise. So whether it be hand washing, so they don't have an excuse why they don't know how to wash hands or the temperature signs so that they know that. And we've got quite a few places. I'm on the No Smoking Coalition. And we have over 100 places that have gone non-smoking in the last eight years. And the citizens of Sheboygan love it. The families can go in without having the smoke bother them. And it's really been quite helpful. And the operators are liking that, that they are going non-smoking. They've seen an increase in business. Wonderful. Two final questions, and I'll turn it over to Mike. Uh, first, if someone's viewing this and you know had an unpleasant experience recently with a restaurant, or it happens in the future, who can they call, or how do they make a complaint so it's looked into? Well, they can call our department, and they get, the number is 459-4347, and leave a message if I don't pick up the phone, or they can leave a voicemail message and we'll go out there and we like to get their name and telephone number so that we can respond to them, tell them what we found and that so that we, they know that we have taken care of it. Outstanding. And then finally, tis the season. Uh, by the time this, this program runs, I think Christmas is going to pa be passed, but New Year's and, and uh, just it's always important that we're handling food properly at home. If you had a few quick tips for our viewers, what do you think is most important to stress? What should people be doing more carefully when they're handling food or preparing meals for their loved ones? Okay, first of all, be washing those hands. You have to wash them thoroughly for 20 seconds in hot lathered soap. Use paper towel to dry them, not on your pants or your sweater or something like that. And then keep food separate. Keep your produce separate from your meat so that you don't have cross-contamination with the bacteria. Figure you always have bacteria in your home place. You have to know what to do with it. So keep that separate. Wash your produce, maybe wash the chicken, and make sure that you cook the food to the proper temperature. If anybody has any problem, you can call our department and find out or we can mail you out something. But it's very important that chicken is cooked to 165 degrees for at least 15 seconds. Your ground beef, your hamburgers, your ground pork, ground uh, lamb, up to 155 degrees for 15 seconds. Everything else, about 145 degrees for 15 seconds. So important. And then not to leave leftovers on the table for hours and hours. Cool it down and put it in refrigeration and cover it so that you don't have any contamination of it. Excellent. And when you reheat the food, make sure you reheat it fast so that you kill the bacteria that might be on that food. Cutting boards are a big issue, oh. aren't they? You, folks will get the, the chicken prepared on the cutting board and then they'll start their salad. Right. Absolute no-no. That's right. what you mean by making sure you're keeping right. that you separate. Wash it, rinse it, and make sure that all that bacteria is off of there. Excellent. Thank you, Bruce. Mm -hmm. Well, Bruce, I guess I'm going to scratch raw beef sandwiches off <laughs> my menu for this Christmas. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And um, state funding for your programs has been fairly stagnant over the last couple of years. I know that there's been an increase in people that are looking for services, and there's also been some stu new statewide initiatives. Could you describe some of those, please? Sure. And as always, you know, new state initiatives always don't come with new money, so keep that in mind. Yeah. But I think many people are aware that Badger Care Plus, which expanded the medical assistance program to parents with children, uh, started early this year, and we've seen a significant increase in the number of families in Sheboygan County applying for and becoming eligible, which is really great because now they can get funding towards their medical care. So that's been an expansion. And our economic support staff that I forgot to talk about earlier determine um, eligibility for that. So, of course, they've seen their workload increase significantly, but understand how important this is for the families that we work with. The other thing that um, I think is exciting to me is we have the new Department of Children and Families um, down in Madison, and they've been able to institute some things that I think are very, very helpful to the residents of Sheboygan County. And right before I came, I went on just to double check to make sure the website was working. But if you go to our website and you go to links, you can go to the state of Wisconsin, and you can actually get into the Department of Children and Families website, and you can actually get into the Wisconsin Child Care Search part. So if you're a young parent and you're looking for child care for your child, you can actually find a child care provider and by going through the steps, and it's fairly simple, you can find out has that child care provider been um, uh, recertified or relicensed? Have they had any violations? What were the violations for? 
So it gives you a chance to see not only where you can locate child care providers, but how they are regulated and where their violations are. So that has been a, a just fantastic service. Um, and in fact, being a new grandparent, I told my daughter about it, so she was able to use it to look for a child care provider in the Milwaukee area. So those are kind of two of the things right now that I think are um, not only exciting, but um, ways that we're using technology um, to help people. Because even with the Medicaid program and food share program, people can go into the state website through the Department of Health and through the asset system, do a preliminary application and apply online that we can then screen that. So more and more, um, the state is starting to use technology to help us do our jobs also. So it's been nice this year to see that's, some positive changes. That's great. As you know, the state mandates many programs for you to run. And unfortunately, they don't always give us all the money that we need to meet the needs that we find here in Sheboygan mm -hmm. County. Um, could you describe a little bit about how this has impacted us here in Sheboygan? Well, I have to say that from my perspective, um, and I can't say this for every county because not every county operates this way, but we have been truly um, recognized as a leader in health and human services. The county board has stepped forward even with budget targets many times to help us meet those state mandates because they're underfunded. So for an example, this past budget cycle, the Birth to Three program, uh, which is a mandated program and we can't put children on a wait list, the county came forward with some additional money through the budget process to help us maintain that program and serve these very vulnerable children who have um, delays, whether it be speech or physical or occupational delays, that can be worked with to really give them a head start as they go forward. When we look at our child protective services system, we can't say when we get a referral, well, we'll, we'll get to you two weeks from now. We have to go out immediately and within 24 hours at a minimum. So the county has always put money into our child protective services and behavioral health. Right now we have the ad hoc committee looking at behavioral health services for adults. There are significant county dollars that go into that behavioral health system. So we're fortunate that the county board um, and the residents of Sheboygan County had recognized the importance. And by doing this, we hopefully offset deep end costs down the road in terms of children in corrections or adults with mental health issues in jails and that type of thing. Well, the, uh, the winter is upon us and it yeah. came rather quick <laughs> this year. So we've got a lot of cold temperatures. And uh, are there some services that low income families can access to, to help them get through the, the, the winter months and keep their homes warm? Mm -hmm. The Wisconsin Home Energy Assistance Program, it's called WHEAP, W-H-E-A-P, uh, is something that actually operates from October 1st of this year through September, uh, the end of September of next year, and that's how that season always works. I can tell you that um, last year we had around 3,000 households that were assisted based on that cycle. Already, the latest report I had through the end of November shows 2,000 households that have applied for that. You can do that through our economic support unit, and by just going to the Sheboygan County website, clicking on our Department of Health and uh, or Health and Human Services, it'll take you right there that you can access the, the WEEP program information. Uh, much of that can be done through a mail-in application. Um, in addition, because so many families are just struggling with meeting so many needs, we're encouraging people to at least take a look at would they be eligible for food share. And I know there was one woman the other night that was on one of the Milwaukee stations saying it was only $14 a month, but $14 could pay for someone's high blood pressure medication for a month if they could get that uh, assistance with food. So we encourage them to apply for any of those economic support benefit packages to see if they're eligible and how we might help them. Through public health, and, and Bruce is a, a member of our public health staff, we have the Women, Infant, and Children program. So if you're a new parent or a pregnant woman, you could apply for the WIC program, and that would help you out also. Okay, and recently there was a news feature that said that Wisconsin was ready for a health disaster. At Health and Human Services, uh, how does your department get involved and uh, undertake programs to, uh, to alleviate these kinds of problems? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, ever since the um, attack on the Twin Towers, there's been an investment in Homeland Security. And, and public health um, became a very important part of that. And more recently, as we began planning, we also have to plan for our special needs population, which be, would be our elderly, our children in foster homes, or individuals that we have in, in group living settings. So through the, the lead of public health, we actually do tabletop exercises. So we can plan not only for a pandemic, but also for 
natural disasters. Flooding is an example. Um, so we can do that through the tabletop and we work with our community partners to do that. So we actually come up with a scenario and everybody around the table reacts in a way they would have to react and it's all condensed into a very short period of